Good morning. Welcome to our English worship this morning. Since the middle of March last year, we have been studying the Gospel of Mark. Today, we have come to the final sermon in our Mark series. The title of our sermon series is a remarkable testimony. Not because Mark is a remarkable writer, but because Jesus, Mark's subject, is a remarkable savior. What kind of a book is the Gospel of Mark? Martin Kyler, a German biblical scholar, once introduced Mark this way. He said the Gospel of Mark is essentially a passion narrative with an extended introduction. A passion narrative with an extended introduction. Mark spent 10 chapters on Jesus' three years ministry, minus the final week. Then in Mark chapter 11, we embark on Jesus' final week on earth, and that final week will go all the way from chapter 11 to chapter 16. In Mark chapter 11, we see Jesus enter Jerusalem triumphantly, riding on a donkey. He chose to ride on the donkey because more than a thousand years ago, when Solomon was to be anointed as the king of Israel, he too rode on the donkey, King David's donkey. Who is Jesus? He is the son of David. He is the king of Israel. But he is a king like no others. In Jerusalem, in that holy city, Jesus would put on a crown, not of gold, but of thorns for his people. He had come to save his people, not from physical enemies, but from their sins. Believe it or not, we have spent the past five months studying the final 24 hours of Jesus' life. Jesus' last day began with the preparation for the Passover meal, the Passover lamb. And that last day ended with his loud cry on the cross, it is finished. There on the cross, Jesus became for us the perfect lamb of God. He is the Passover lamb, the atoning sacrifice for our sins. This is his ultimate mission. It's the mission of the Son of God. In Mark chapter 14, after the Last Supper, we enter with Jesus into the dark Gethsemane. There he took Peter, James, and John deep into the garden, praying to his Father in heaven. There three times Jesus pleaded with his disciples to stay awake and pray. And three times the disciple gave way to that flesh and fell into sleep and temptation. Then Judas returned. With a crowd, with swords and clubs, and after some struggle, Jesus was arrested. The disciples were scattered, leaving Jesus alone in the garden. Alone to be arrested, alone to face trials in the dark, alone to be condemned to the cross. From the dark night into the early morning, Jesus went through a total of six trials, three trials in the dark by the Jews and three trials in the morning by the Romans. By the end of his trial, Pilate, the Roman governor, knew deep down in his heart that Jesus was innocent. But Pilate was not able to withstand the mounting pressure from the Jewish leader. So Pilate released the rebel murderer Barabbas and sent Jesus, the Prince of Peace, the Son of God, to the cross. After the scouting and the mocking, they led Jesus out to Golgotha to be crucified. On the surface, Jesus' life was fading away. But yes, spiritually, if you were here with us two weeks ago, yes, spiritually and actually, he was gaining more power as he moved closer and closer to his glorious throne on the cross. From his throne on the cross, he would call sinners out of that darkness into his marvelous light. Remember what happened on the road to Golgotha. Jesus passed by, he passed by, and he called. And a man by the name of Simon of Cyrene, he responded. And his sons, his two young sons, later will follow Jesus as well. Their names were Alexander and Rufus. And after Jesus gave up his spirit on the cross, he still called from the cross. 
and Joseph of Arimathea, together with Nicodemus, responded to Jesus. Who is Jesus? He is the savior of sinners. Who is Jesus? He is the mighty king on the cross. And from the cross, he called men and women to carry the cross and follow him. And people responded to his call. This is the power of the cross. But there's still more to that power. What if we are to pair up the cross with the empty tomb? What will happen? Can you imagine the kind of power these two things can generate? The cross and the empty tomb together, what kind of power they can generate? That power will change this world. So this is the exciting question that Mark is leaving us with. He had one more story to tell, and very intriguing and marvelous story. What if we pair up the cross with the empty tomb? What will happen? What kind of power will that generate? So that takes us into Mark chapter 16, verse 1. When the Sabbath was passed, Mary Madeline, Mary the mother of James and Solomon, bought spices so that they may go and anoint Jesus. It's very interesting, Mark would introduce new character in this final episode of the gospel. And these are not just extra, unimportant side character. They are character with names. Notice that each of them were given names, so they are very important people. They are supporting actresses in this story of the gospel. Mark chapter 16, verse 5, And entering the tomb, they saw a young man sitting on the right side, dressed in the white robe, and they were alarmed. They saw a young man, but the young man was not Jesus. And he said to them, verse 6, Do not be alarmed. You seek Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified. He has risen. He is not here. See the place where they lay him. He has risen. What a great, 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 great news. They thought Jesus is dead, and he was dead. But no more. He is now alive. What a great news. So go tell disciples and Peter that he is going before you to Galilee, that you will see him just as he told you, just as he already prophesied. Now, if you remember, after the Last Supper, Jesus prophesied that I will go before you to Galilee. So go, hurry, go tell this great news to the disciple, to Peter. So here we are, we are down to the final verse in Mark, Mark chapter 16, verse 8. If you were to, uh, to use your imagination, if you were to fill out this final verse in your English class, what would you write? I would write something like this, and they went out in great joy, singing and praising God, boldly sharing the good news, for they could not contain their joy. And isn't that a wonderful end to this remarkable testimony? But here's the question, is that what Mark recorded? And the answer is no, not only it is not like that, it was quite the opposite. Mark chapter 16, verse 8. And they went out and fled from the tomb, for trembling and astonishment has seized them, and they said nothing to anyone. They were supposed to tell everyone about Jesus, but they say nothing to anyone, for they were afraid, not joyful, but afraid. What a bizarre ending. Totally disconnected from the preceding story. Everything was built up for this moment. This verse is supposed to be the climax of the climax. But this story ends with a downer. Can this be the real final verse of a remarkable testimony. But how can you fail us with this masterpiece? I mean, how can you fail your masterpiece with a verse like that? Even if what you wrote is true, even if the women were frightened and afraid, you can always add a few more lines. Just tell us they, they came around. Just tell us that they repented, and then they tell the good news, and everybody went out to tell the good news. Don't end like this. This is not just the end. It's also a new beginning, the beginning of the church. Don't end your gospel this way. So because the gospel of Mark 
end this way with this verse, mysterious verse. Over the century, there have been a lot of speculation. I mean it. People speculate what happened to Mark. Maybe he fell ill. Maybe he was Martha. So he never get to complete his gospel. So the gospel feel incomplete with Mark chapter 16, verse 8. So some early Christians decided to help Mark, to help him to fill out the void. That's why we have an alternate ending. We have verse 9 to 20 in our Bible. So let's take a quick look of verse 9 to 20. Now you see, I use a different form because I don't believe that's part of the Bible. It's added by some early Christian. But let's read it quickly through. Now when he rose early on the first day of the week, he appeared first to Mary Madeline, for whom he had cast out seven demons. So it's kind of retelling of the resurrection story because they were not satisfied with Mark's ending. She sent and told those who had been with him as they mourned and wept. And when they heard that he was alive and had seen by her, they would not believe it. After these things, they appear in another, he appeared in another form to two of them as they were walking into the country. And they went back and told the rest, and they did not believe them. They still don't believe him. Uh, afterwards, he appeared to the eleven themselves as they were reclining at the table, and he rebuked them for their unbelief and hardness of heart because they have not believed those who saw him after he has risen. And he said to them, go into the world. So he rebuilt them, but not for rejection, but for restoration. And then he sent them. Wow, that's, we're getting to the heart of the matter. This is wonderful. And he said to them, go to the world and proclaim the gospel to the whole creation. Jesus has risen. Tell them about this good news. Whoever believes and is baptized will be saved, will be saved from sin, will be saved from death. Whoever does not believe, Condemned. This is awesome. This is what we have been anticipating, what we have been looking for, right? Verse 17, And these signs will accompany those who believe in my name. They will cast out demons. They will speak in new tongues. They will pick up serpents with their hands. And if they drink any deadly poison, it will not hurt them. They will lay their hands on the sick and they will recover. Now that's getting a little bit strange. Now, all these miracles, I believe, are probably true. But if you ask me, such kind of emphasis, it doesn't sound like Mark at all. If you have been with us studying through the Gospel of Mark, as I've been arguing, Mark was never quite interested in the miracle. Mark was more concerned with the cross and the empty tomb. Everything flowed to the cross and the empty tomb. Not, it's not about the miracle, but here we see an emphasis, a, a very not like Mark kind of emphasis on the miracle. So let's keep reading. We have two more verses to complete. And then the Lord Jesus, after he had spoken to them, was taken up into heaven and sat down at the right hand of God. Amen. And they went out and preached everywhere while the Lord worked with them and confirmed with message by accompany, accompanying sign. Well, this is a great ending, isn't it? That's what we would expect the gospel so, and they went out to preach the gospel to the entire world. But as good as this sounds, we're pretty sure that this is not part of the gospel. This alternate ending from verse 9 to 20 is not part of the gospel. It's more likely to be an appendix written by some early Christians who are not satisfied, who were not satisfied with Mark's original ending. The intention was good because they don't want people to be puzzled with that final verse about the women being afraid. But what they wrote down is not helpful. It's what I would call adding feet to a snake. You know, have you heard that Chinese idiom? Adding feet to a snake. You ruin a masterpiece. So can you imagine someone walk into a museum looking at a Rembrandt a painting or Da Vinci, and then decide to add two more strokes to it. And you think that you are doing him a favor, but what you did is you ruined the entire thing. No, don't do that. We're pretty sure that 9 to 20 is a late addition because of three reasons. Now, we don't have photocopies of original manuscript of the Gospel of Mark, but we have a lot of hand copies. 
And of those manuscripts, the oldest one, they don't have 9 to 20. So we, we kind of know that the, the, the oldest manuscript only end with verse 8, and then there are newer ones, I mean, uh, less reliable ones that they had those. And also, you observe the, the style of writing, the content, the message. They don't seem to sing in with the rest of the mark. So I think the better way to look at this section from 9 to 20 is look at them as some kind of footnote, some kind of reflection on the resurrection story by early Christian. And if you look at them as a whole, you will see that three themes that came out from this footnote. And the three themes are stubborn unbelief, rebuking and calling. Jesus called them again. And then they returning, and Jesus sent them into this world. Now, interestingly, these three points actually make a very good outline for today's sermon. However, I want to give you something more vivid and colorful. I want to give you something more vivid and colorful to Mark's magnificent conclusion. I want to show you how magnificent that is. And the three points are very easy to remember. They work very well as children's Sunday school material. Three women, two young men, one savior. Three women, two young men, and one savior. Biblical scholars tell us that if we study carefully Mark 15 to 16, if we move from Mark 15 to 16, we observe two major movements, two major movements. The first movement, from the grave to the grave, and the second movement, from the grave to the grave. Do you understand what I'm saying? I hope you're not colorblind. From the blue and empty grave to the red and occupied grave. That's the first movement. The second movement is from the occupied red grave to the blue and empty grave. And if we are to view these two movements from Jesus' perspective, what we got is this. From the cross to the grave, and from the grave to resurrection, you see? So there are two movements. One is in Mark chapter 15. The other one is Mark chapter 16. Mark 15 is about from the cross to the grave, and Mark 16 is from the grave to resurrection. So biblical scholar once again challenge us to rethink about this whole big section. Uh, when we study Mark chapter 15 and 16 carefully, not casually, uh, we begin to see a chiasm emerge. Uh, it, it, we find a complicated literary device in the shape of A, B, C, D, E, D, C, B, A. It's very interesting. So there was A, B, C, D, E. That was the first movement. It is from the cross to the grave. And then you have a reverse movement from the grave to resurrection. Part one is contain the movement from the cross to the grave, and part two contain the movement from the grave to resurrection. Part one, recorded in Mark 15, took place on the day before the Sabbath. So there's a very clear marker to tell you that this is part one. Part one is before the Sabbath, and part two, recorded in Mark 16, took place on the day after the Sabbath. So we're sandwiching around this Sabbath, the, the day of no action. Now, but that is not a usual Sabbath. It's the most Sabbath, most important Sabbath of the year. Remember, that was the Passover. It was the Sabbath of the Passover. And what happened on that Passover? That's and not just another Passover. That was the Passover where Jesus was crucified, dead, and buried. So when you look at what happened in the first movement, what happened in the first movement is a testimony of the power of the cross. Joseph of Arimathea took courage. He went. Pilate was surprised Jesus had died. Joseph broke a stone against the entrance. Mary saw where he was laid. So that's the first movement, but this is not or because there's still a second half, the second half that began with the empty tomb. The empty tomb is sandwiched in the middle. We have now the empty tomb to pair with the cross. So you see, there is a, a, the first part is much darker because Jesus is dead. 
So now the second half is all bright and beautiful. So you can expect something great happening on the second half, right? If something good happened in the first half, namely that Joseph came forward with great courage, imagine the kind of power now magnified and augmented by the empty tomb. What kind of power? What, what are we going to see? Well, this is the second movement. Mary went to the tomb. They saw the stone had been rolled back. They were alarmed. Jesus had risen. Now you see the beautiful parallel, you know, how Mary saw where he was laid. Mary saw the tomb. Mary went to the tomb. Joseph rolled a stone. They saw the stone rolled back. Pilate was surprised he died. They were alarmed. He had risen. You see that everything was like that. And everything is setting us up for the final verse. So if there was already an explosion in the upper section, you should expect another great explosion, a gospel explosion, a joy explosion, a courage explosion in the second half, right? So what we have here is, and they, and they fled the tomb, trembling, and were afraid. How can this be? Something is wrong. Something is terribly wrong. Either something is terribly wrong with the gospel or something is terribly wrong with the women. So who do you think? What is, what is wrong with? What is that something that has gone wrong? The problem, of course, is not with the gospel. The problem is with the women. So, so you see that how Mark lay out this final challenge shows there's something wrong with the women. And he is, in a way, using the women to challenge that there could be something wrong with you. And if there's something wrong with you, you need to fix it. And so he's using this story, the final story, to challenge us. So let me take you back to the gospel to look at what's wrong with this woman. There were also women looking on from a distance Mark 15, 40, among whom were Mary Madeline, Mary, the mother of James, the younger, and of Joseph, Joseph and Salami. Notice there was a key verb here, which will be repeated again and again and again and again. The key word is seeing or looking. In this, in this translation, it's looking, but it can also be translated as seeing. What's the point of women seeing? What's the point of seeing? What's the point of God? Letting the women see. The point is that you see so that you can witness, so that seeing is for witnessing, seeing is for preaching, seeing is for proclamation of the gospel to the end of this world. So I want you to mark it down with you. Now, of course, in our case, we are no longer the first generation. We don't get to see, but we get to hear. What's the point of you hearing the gospel? Is that you will bear witness to the gospel. You will preach the gospel. You will proclaim the gospel to the end of this world. Mark this down. Keep reading. Mark chapter 15, verse 41. When he was, when Jesus was in Galilee, the women followed him and ministered to him. And there were also many other women who came up with him to Jerusalem. Now notice that these women have a history with Jesus. They were following him already and serving him in Galilee. But more than that, they also follow him all the way to Jerusalem. Now that's very significant. They did not just run into Jesus by accident in Jerusalem over Passover. It's not like Jesus went to Jerusalem and they went to Jerusalem separately and over Passover, hey Jesus, I didn't expect to see you here. Look at it. Wow, what a coincidence. No, they, they were with him all the way. They were with him all the way. Why is that important? It's important because if they were with Jesus throughout the entire journey from Galilee to Jerusalem, then it's highly likely that this woman had heard Jesus' own prophecy about himself. I want to take you back to Mark chapter 10, verse 32. Very important section of the gospel and they were on the road going to jerusalem you see halfway through mark jesus is already setting his sights on jerusalem going to jerusalem where his most important work will be accomplished and jesus was walking ahead of them and they were amazed and those who follow were afraid jesus was ahead of them 
Those who follow were afraid. You see, it's a picture. If you remember that sermon I preached on this, it's a spiritual picture about how they were not able to catch up with him. They they don't know who he is spiritually. They could not walk by his side. And those who follow him were afraid. Could this include the women? Well, I think so. So there's something interesting about this woman. They were afraid then. And now as resurrection, they were afraid. And I will say they were even more afraid than before. So at some point when they were following Jesus, Jesus became a possessed man. He was walking right in front of them to Jerusalem. And they have no idea who Jesus is. They have no idea what Jerusalem is for. So they are afraid. They were afraid then. Now they will become even more afraid later at the empty tomb. Mark this down. Very interesting observation. Mark chapter 10, verse 33. See, we are going to Jerusalem. Now, if you remember the contact, Jesus taking the 12 again, he pulled them aside, maybe, you know, and began to tell them what was going to happen to him. See, we are going to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man will be delivered over to the chief priests and the scribe, and they will condemn him to death and deliver him over to Gentiles. So this is supposed to be a private conversation with the twelve, but we don't know how private it is. Think, imagine that we now suddenly have a new picture. The picture is not Jesus leading the twelve going to Jerusalem. It's Jesus leading, I don't know how many, 50, 60 group of people, and among them were the twelve. So sometimes he pulled the twelve over for some private conversation, but there was no privacy when you're traveling with such a large group of people. So these are a few things we begin to understand there are other traveling with Jesus. And they journey together for quite a long time from Galilee all the way to Jerusalem. And it's entirely possible, even if Jesus had some private teaching moments, private session with his disciples, the news will get spread to the crowd they're traveling. And Jesus, I want you to think about that. He did not just prophesy once. This is not something that Jesus pulled them over. I'm going to say it once. You better pay attention. If you, if you forget, I'm not going to repeat. No, Jesus actually repeatedly prophesied about this thing. And in the gospel, in the four gospel, we know he at least prophesied about his death and resurrection three times. But this is at least. Could it be that the three times are tips of the iceberg? So I want you to begin to think about that. If you will imagine the central teaching when Jesus was on the way to Jerusalem is the cross and the empty tomb. So it's not something that Jesus woke up one morning, desired, let's see what we're going to talk about today. Let's talk about healing. Tomorrow, let's talk about feeding. The next day, let's talk about miracle. And then the fourth day, okay, we haven't talked about the cross for a while. Let's talk about the cross. No. Every day Jesus woke up thinking about the cross and the empty tomb. That becomes the dominating, the central teaching of his journey from Galilee to Jerusalem. So Jesus says, see, we are going to Jerusalem. The Son of Man will be delivered. They will be condemned dead. But that's not all. They will mock him, spit on him, flog him, kill him. And on the third day, after three days, he will rise. This is something he's talking for a long, long time. And guess what? The woman heard him. But the woman did not understand him, just like the disciple. More than that, they did not believe what he said. And so they were afraid, you know. Afraid is a very in interesting adjective in the gospel. Afraid meaning unbelief. Afraid means they don't know him. That's why you're afraid. I'm not, I'm not talking about our kind of afraid. We are not afraid of Jesus. But they were. They were because they did not know who he is. And if we don't know who Jesus is, if we don't have the right relation with him, we ought to be afraid of him. So eventually, this not knowing who Jesus is leads to that fearful running away from the tomb. You, you see that? The women end up, what is the final picture of the women? They run away from the tomb. They run away from Jesus because they, do, they did not know him. And their running away is contrasted with Joseph's courageous coming to receive Jesus' corpse, you see? So there was one group running away, the other one 
coming. So I want to take you back to Mark chapter 15 and read about Joseph. And Joseph bought a linen straw and taking him down, wrapped him in the linen straw and laid him in a tomb that had been cut out of the rock. And he rolled a stone against the entrance of the tomb. So I know uh, we commonly understand the women's going, waking up early uh, in the morning and going to the tomb uh, to anoint Jesus. We remember the story. We usually think of that story as an act of great love and devotion. And we'll talk about it on Easter and say, how wonderful would it be if we could be like the women? If we could wake up in the morning, if we could wake up to greet Jesus at the tomb, if we could uh, bring our gift uh, to anoint him as our, our love and devotion. I know this is commonly what, how we read that story, but when you read closer, at the gospel, you realize the women's act was being parallel and contrasted with Joseph and Nicodemus. And the women's act was actually negative, while the man's act is positive. So what we find in the gospel is two parties went to annoy Jesus. One are guys, the others are female. Now, I'm not trying to be sexist at all. Please don't misunderstand me. But this is the story that being conscious, the two story being conscious. One group, Joseph and Nicodemus. The other group, the three women named. One went first, the other one went later. Now on the surface, both groups look like mirror image of each other, right? Both groups love Jesus and both groups want to do respect uh, of, of Jesus. So they went with spices, with uh, mirth, uh, with aloe to and not Jesus' body, but notice the contrast. The two groups could not be more different from each other. Their difference is like night and day. One group, the first group, the first party, Joseph and Nicodemus anointed Jesus as king. They brought 75 pounds of mirth. 75, no, no one will use that much for anybody except for the king. They anointed Jesus as king, as God's chosen king, as God's chosen Messiah and Christ, and they anointed Jesus as their very own king. The other party, the women, they went to anoint Jesus as if Jesus is a, an innocent good man, a beloved teacher and friend. So do you understand what I'm trying to say? One knows who Jesus is. The other, they don't. They don't know who Jesus is. So one party went to anoint Jesus out of their natural love and devotion. You know, there are some people who are genuinely emotional or loving. And so these women, they went to anoint Jesus out of their natural love and devotion. The other party went to anoint Jesus out of extraordinary, unexplainable, supernatural transformation. That's where the contrast is. One is natural, the other one is unnatural, the other one is supernatural. So this is the difficulty of reading this resurrection story because we read them as if both groups are the same, but they are actually quite the opposite. So if I were to make a Easter play, now, not a Christmas play anymore, it's an Easter play. I may try to write a story from the perspective of Joseph's young servant. Now, imagine Joseph of Marathia, he has a young servant. Or from the perspective of Nicodemus' wife, you as assuming that Nicodemus had a wife. And the title of my Easter play will be, My Master Has Gone Mad, or My Husband Has Gone Crazy. And I would ask someone to play out a good man. I want someone, I want the actor to look like a good man, a generous man, a man who is always there to help, a man who is reading the Bible and praying all this while. But this man, at the same time, he is very stable. He is very rational. He is risk averse. He is security driven. He calculates everything. He wants to make sure everything goes according to plan. I want a man like that. And then on that Easter morning, something happened to that man, something unexplainable, something supernatural. 
something out of the ordinary that rational, risk adverse man gone crazy. That is the Easter story. On the other hand, when the women went to anoint Jesus, that story came with a sense of normalcy, of ordinariness. Yes, it's emotional, but it's only natural because that is how they were. But when you look back at the story of Joseph and Nicodemus, these two men, they were spellbound. They were possessed men. They could not help themselves. They could not help themselves but pour out 75 pounds of mirth on Jesus. They could not help themselves but touch Jesus with their own hands. They could not help themselves, but for Jesus' sake, they lost everything. So I want you to think about all that contrast. Now we are back to the ladies, the women. Mary Madeline and Mary, the mother of Joseph, saw where he was laid. Again, what's the point of seeing? so that they may bear witness, they may preach, they may proclaim that to the end of this world. They saw the cross. They now saw the tomb. Okay, so they saw the cross. They saw the tomb. And when the Sabbath was passed, Mary Madeline, Mary, uh, the mother of James and Solomon, uh, bought spices so that they may go and anoint him. A sense of normalcy. Normalcy. Nothing extraordinary. Just assume they are just doing it out, out of their natural tendency. Verse 2, and very early in the first day of the week when the sun had risen, they went to the tomb and they were saying, who will roll away the stone for us from the entrance of the tomb? And looking up, they saw, again they saw, why, why, why did God want them to see? Okay, so that they may bear witness, so that they may preach and proclaim that to the end of this world, they saw the stone have been rolled away. They stole the stone, but no, God wants you to proclaim the resurrection. The stone signified resurrection. Verse 5, and entering into the dome, they saw, they saw a young man, but the young man lead them to Jesus. Why they see? Why did they see something? It's for them to bear witness to. It's for them to preach and proclaim to the end of this world. They saw a young man sitting at the right side, dressed in a white robe, and they were alarmed. Verse 6, and they said to him, do not be, and he said to them, do not be alarmed. You seek Jesus of Nazareth who was crucified. He has risen. He is not here. See the place where they lay him. Come and see the empty tomb. Why? Why should they see? So that they may bear witness to it. So they may preach it and proclaim it to the end of this world. Well, verse 7, and so go tell the disciple and Peter, that he is going before you to Galilee. There you will see him, just as he told you. This is a one, one of the most moving verses, one of the most moving verses in the gospel. Jesus said, or the young man said, go tell his disciples and Peter's. Jesus didn't say, go tell someone else, because these two guys, this group of people have failed. You know, you failed your test. You have been expelled from your school. Let someone else have a chance to study. No, Jesus didn't say that. Go tell the disciple and Peter. Why? Because the gospel is for sinners. The gospel is calling sinners to repent. So if we are to spell it out in full, it will be something like that. Go tell the disciple who forsook me. Go tell Peter who denied me three times. Tell them. Tell them I have risen, I have died for them, I have been raised for them. Not to shame them, not to condemn them, but to forgive them, to restore them, to call them back and to send them out again. And there in Galilee, you will see him. They will all see him. Why? Why seeing him is important. They saw him so that they could bear witness, so that they could preach and proclaim him to the end of this earth. Verse 8. And they went out and fled from the tomb, for trembling and astonishment seized them, and they said nothing to anyone, for they were afraid. What an end to the Gospel of Mark. Now, if you don't understand Mark's genius, you probably will be saying, what a disastrous ending. This is supposed to be a masterpiece, and Mark failed us in the final, final verse. 
So once again, did Mark fail? No, Mark did not fail. Did the gospel fail? No, the gospel did not fail. Who fell? The women fell. They fell in the test of faith. So the women fell. They showed their true color at the empty tomb. Now that takes us back to the big picture, the outline, the sermon outline. We have three unbelieving women, two clothed young men. Okay, we'll get back to that later. And one resurrected Savior, one crucified and resurrected Savior. So once again, please do not misunderstand me. I'm not sexist, neither is Mark. But Mark here is using this woman, using this woman not as an example of love and devotion. He's not asking us to imitate them, wake up early in the morning. Rather, Mark is using them as an example of people who did not know Jesus. They did not know Jesus. That's why they are afraid. But there is hope. Hope for the women. Hope for us who are like the women. Hope in the crucified and resurrected Jesus. So Mark is inviting us to follow that logic. So the logic of the sermon outline goes this way. Unbelieving women and men. How if you would turn to the crucified and resurrected Savior, Jesus Christ, Mark is inviting us to move, to fix our eyes on Jesus, to move, to embrace Jesus, to love him, to believe in him, to follow him all the days of our life. If we do that, then he will make us into the young man who is now clothed with right robes. Now, that is a fantastic way to end the gospel. He was promising us of what would become of us if we would turn to him. If we, one, we'll go to two, we'll end with three. Who are the two young men? Some of you may remember this mysterious young man from Mark chapter 14. There are two young men in the gospel of Mark. The first one we encounter here. And the young man follow him. Jesus, this is in the Garden of Eden, uh, Garden of Gethsemane, with nothing but a linen cloth about his body, and they seized him, and he left the linen cloth and ran away naked. Now, we don't know, remember, we don't know who this young man was, but he could possibly be mocked, because no one else knows this story. It's such a, a intimate, a private story. So we think that this man could be mocked, but it's not that important. The more important is what this man symbolized. This young man had nothing on him but a linen cloth. Biblical scholars tell us that the linen cloth is made up of plant fabrics. So this is a young man who is wearing plants on himself on that dark night that reminds us of another naked young man. Another naked young man in the garden clothed with plants trying to escape the shame and the guilt. And that was Adam. Adam in the Garden of Eden. And so in this story, Jesus became Adam's substitute. And this man, this young man, left the linen cloth and ran away naked. But he's still naked. However, when this young man appears again, resurfaced in Mark chapter 16, he is now fully clothed. So let me read to you from chapter 16, verse 5. And entering the tomb, they saw a young man sitting on the right side, now dressed in a white robe. This man has clothes on. He escaped. Now he has white robe on him, and they were alarmed. Now, before you protest, I, I, you know, of course I don't mean these two young men were the same person. No, it's not. But Mark clearly wanted to connect these two young men for us. If you read the Gospels account in Matthew, this young man was an angel. In Luke, there was a man, simply a man, only Mark tells us he's a young man. He used the term young man, and that term young man only appeared two times in the Gospel of Mark, one in 14, one in 16. So Mark wanted us to connect this to young man. Look, what will happen to you if you trust in the crucified and risen Jesus? Look, what Christ will do for you. And what Christ would do for us is he will clothe us with a white cloth. Now, obviously, it's a symbol. Now, even today, when you get baptized in church, we would not give you a white cloth. 
a white robe, right? We'll give you a Bible. Uh, the white robe is a symbol. It's a symbol of what? Now, first of all, it's a symbol of Christ's righteousness freely given to sinners, right? It is God's righteousness by the blood of the Lamb. Right? I always love this Chinese word, righteousness. It's me underneath the Lamb. It's because of the blood of the Lamb that now I'm clothed with Christ's righteousness. If you get a chance to go back to read from Revelation chapter 7, there was a scene in which John saw a group of people clothed in white robes. So John asked, who are these people? And one of the elders explained, they have washed their robes and make them white in the blood of the Lamb. So what is the right robe? It's Christ's righteousness. It's because of the blood of the Lamb that now we have Christ on us, his righteousness. So that's one way to look at this white robe. But there is another angle to understand this white robe. The white robe is a symbol of an extreme makeover, of an extreme makeover. Have you watched Extreme Makeover, this American TV show? Now, if you haven't, don't, don't, no need to go back to, to watch it at all. But a long time ago when I was in America, I watched a few episodes of it. So uh, the most common, the, the most popular version is the home edition. So you have a really terrible, dirty, lousy home. So somebody, you know, uh, uh, tell you, uh, let me uh, take you away for a short trip, maybe three to five days. And while you're away, what would they do? They surprise you with an extreme makeover of your home. And then by the time you get back, they unveil the home. Wah! You know, they cry and cry and cry. That's called extreme makeover home edition. But notice that it's not a true rebuilding. They only have five days. What are they going to do? They're going to just patch up things. They're going to make superficial kind of renovation and covering up all the dirt. They're not going to rebuild your house from ground up, from inside up. It's not an extreme makeover. It's not a real makeover. And then there's the other addition, the people addition of the extreme makeover, which is even scarier. So usually, you have someone who doesn't look very appealing but someone who have a crush on somebody. So you say, I really like this boy, but I don't look very appealing. So what do you do? Well, if you look ugly enough, the, the show will give you free cosmetic surgeries. They will put makeup on you, all the fancy clothing, so that you can win over your Prince Charming. But that is not an extreme makeover. It's all fake, but the extreme makeover Jesus will give us is of a different kind. It's inside out. The naked shall be clothed in white, and the Spirit will give birth to a new soul. The Holy Spirit will give birth to a new soul. It is a true extreme makeover. So this white cloth that you put on is not just for show. Imagine if you can, that this white cloth has real transforming power. It's like, have a some kind of powerful radiation. You know, usually we, we think of radiation negatively, but imagine when you put on Christ, there is this gospel radiation, powerful radiation that's changing you, changing your inside out, extreme makeover. And what happened? What is the outcome of putting on this white robe? What's the outcome of this gospel radiation? The outcome is a cross-bearing life. Burning hearts, open eyes. So this white robe become for us the combat armor of God's kingdom soldiers. So can you imagine that? That's one picture, but has so many, many deep meaning. Now I know that in the story, in Mark's gospel, other than this young man, we haven't seen anyone else with a white robe. But let me tell you that Joseph of Arimathea definitely put on a white robe and look at the kind of power that he had because he put on that white robe. Joseph of Arimathea is the prototype of a born-again soldier. And if you remember from two weeks ago, this born-again kingdom soldier is equipped with three powerful weapons, a lion heart, a piggy bank that's ready to be shattered for God's kingdom and a blank sheet 
a paper. That's what the white robe, the new life, symbolizes. Isn't that wonderful? But there's still more. There's still more. If you are familiar with the Gospel of Mark, if you are familiar with it, you may remember that we have already read another story of transformation, another story from nakedness to fully clothed. You remember there was a story. So this is a second story of being clothed. There was another story. Where is the story in Mark chapter 5? In Mark chapter 5, Jesus encountered a man possessed by demons at Jerusalem. Remember the story? That Jesus went to a place after the storm, and he walked up into like a, a tomb. And there he encountered a man, a crazy man, possessed with a lot of demons. And the demon is by the name of Legion. Legion is a Roman military unit, uh, meaning 6,000 foot soldiers plus 120 riders. So what's your name? Our names are Legion. We have many. And what did Jesus do? Cast out the demon for him. And then the demon went to 2,000 pigs. Now, if you remember, uh, if you know that the Jews hated pigs, they're unclean animals from the Old Testament, so they don't eat pig. And the pig ran down the cliff. So the story has all these dramatic elements that you can use for your children's Sunday school. A man possessed with 6,000 plus demons. Jesus cast out the demon. Unclean spirit, the story has three unclean elements. Unclean spirit cast out to unclean animals that got destroyed. But what we forgot is there was still another group of people. Unclean people. Unclean people. I don't know whether you remember the story. Because if we read it as a Sunday children's Sunday school story, we end with how powerful is Jesus. No, the story did not end there. It's just the beginning. It's the background. The background is after Jesus cast out the demons. Look at the villagers respond to Jesus. So they have known this guy. He always, like, like at night, he will cry out. Everybody's scared of him. You know, he will cry out in his tomb in the mountain. Now Jesus casts out this guy, casts out the demons. Let me read to you two verses from Mark chapter 5. And they came to see Jesus and saw the demon possessed crazy man, the one whom who had had the legion sitting there, clothed in his right mind, and they were afraid. Now, you, you remember, uh, this guy, actually, you read before, he was naked. He didn't wear clothes. Now, he is fully clothed and in his right mind. And what was the response to them? They were afraid. They were afraid. Why were they afraid? But more than that, you say, they're shocked by Jesus' power. Sure, look at the next verse. And they began to beg Jesus to depart from the region. What's going on here? What's going on here? Why did they ask Jesus to leave? They were afraid of the demon-possessed man. Now Jesus cast out the demon-possessed man. Shouldn't they be thankful? Why did they ask Jesus to leave? If I live in a building block that's known to be haunted, and Jesus came and cast out 6,000 demons from one particularly haunted apartment. How will we respond to Jesus? We'll ask him to stay for a few more days, right? Just in case more demons will come to attack us. But they asked Jesus to leave. Why? And if you remember my story, my explanation from uh, maybe a couple of years ago, I explained it this way. They were afraid of Jesus' power. Because the people are unclean. They are idolatrous. They secretly worship their own God. And they figure that, oh gosh, does Jesus have real power? If he is going to stay, he is going to rule over us. And they refuse to be ruled by Jesus. That's why they pleaded with him to leave. Because they do not want to be ruled by Jesus. So this is... The kind of interesting twist and turn here in the Gospel of Mark, why are people afraid of Jesus? Because they know their life has not been submitted to him. The disciples were afraid of him in the storm, not because he has great power in the castle of the storm, because they know that they're trying to make use of Jesus instead of bowing down before him. This group of people ask Jesus to leave because they are afraid, because they will not bow down to Jesus. 
That takes us back to the big picture. Why were the women afraid? Why were the women afraid? Because all these years they've been following Jesus. It's hard to imagine, right? They did so much for Jesus, but as it turned out, their life has yet to submit, be submitted to Jesus. And that hit us with the kind of challenge, the spiritual challenge. We could be here at church doing a lot of things. We could be even on staff. I could be even be a pastor. But maybe I should be afraid of Jesus because I'm hiding myself from Jesus. I'm not submitting myself to Jesus. The, the women were already afraid on their way to Jerusalem. And now when they realized Jesus was not a mere man, he, the crucified Jesus had come back to life. He is more than that. And they became even more afraid. Why? Because they did not know Jesus. They did not submit to him. They did not have the right relationship with him. Do you have a right relationship with him? Sometime, you know, I, I got a chance to talk to a lot of different people about their spiritual life. And many people, they are very frank. And some people say that, well, I don't have much of a spiritual life. But there are occasionally other people who say, oh, yeah, I, I, you know, I always grow up going to a Christian school or a Catholic school. And I know the Heavenly Father is loving. You know, I pray to him, you know, and I, I feel his presence in my life. They talk about these things and the way they talk about Jesus make me realize they don't really know Jesus. They should be afraid because they don't have a right relationship with God. What is the right relationship with God? A right relationship with God is a worshiping relationship. Oh, you say, well, we come to worship all the time. I mean, we can't come now because, because of the restrictions. But, oh, once you open up, I will come back. No, it's not about that worshiping relationship. It's about whether we know him to be our king, whether we truly bow before him, whether we give our life to him. Not naturally, but supernaturally. This is what I think Mark is challenging us to ponder. He leaves us with this story because he leaves us with one final challenge, the most important question in this life and in the next. The most important question for eternity, do you know Jesus? Do you truly know Jesus? Do you have a right relationship with him? Do you, do you, are you bowing down before him? Are you worshiping him? As king, is he ruling over you? Or are you simply turning to him when you are in trouble? So what will happen? What will happen if and when this woman will repent and turn to Jesus? I tell you, they will rise. They will rise. They will rise to the top. They will rise to the very top. What is the opposite of being afraid? Do not be afraid. No, no, no. What is the opposite of being afraid? Finding security and confidence in an uncertain future. Am I right, Pastor Lam? No, you're not. What is the opposite of being afraid? The opposite of being afraid is be courageous for the gospel's sake. It's not quite what we think of it, right? Yesterday when I was preaching in the Saturday worship, I thought of this Christmas song that we almost every uh, Easter song, every, almost every Easter we'll sing, Because He Lives. Because He Lives, I can face tomorrow. Because He Lives, all fear is gone. Because I know He holds the future and life is worth a living because He lives. What are you thinking? I have been singing that song for years after years. All I know when I first sang that song as a college student, because he lives, I don't have to fear my exam. Because he lives, I don't have to fear not having a job. Because he lives, all my trouble, he will solve for me. Then wrong, wrong, wrong. What is the opposite of not being afraid? Of, of being afraid? What's the opposite of being afraid? Is that you become courageous. Become courageous like Joseph of Arimathea. Is that what your life is? Is that what my life is? I want to end with the final verse here we are going to look at, but go tell his disciples and Peter that he is going before you to Galilee, and there you will see him just as he told you. He will go before you to Galilee. 
we couldn't quite translate that Greek verb. As it turned out, the Greek verb in ancient Greek literature is being used as a commander leading his troops. So what Jesus is saying that I will be there early in the morning. I'll be making tea and catching fish, waiting for you to come to have breakfast. That's not what Jesus is saying. He said, I will in Galilee. I will be your commander. I will lead you to preach the gospel to the end of this world. I will lead you to leave this world into the eternal kingdom, not in Jerusalem, in Galilee. Galilee is a wonderful place for Christians. Galilee is a horrific place for the Jews. Galilee is the gospel center of the world to come. Galilee has no name, no glory. Galilee is a place no one knows, no one cares, and that is what we are. We are not to seek after the glory of this world. Where is our spiritual capital? Our spiritual capital is not in DC, the capital of power. It's not in New York City, the capital of money and wealth. It's not in Hollywood, the capital of glamour and worldly fame. It is not in Las Vegas, the capital of pleasures and desire. It's not in Boston, the capital of scholastic achievements. Those are not our capital. Our capital is in Galilee. The gospel capital, no name, no glory. No one knows, no one cares. But that's where Jesus will lead us. And from there, Jesus will lead us to the end of this world. How? He will lead us to live a cross-bearing life. He will lead us to forsake this world and seek after his eternal glory. And he will, through us, proclaim the gospel of the cross and the empty tomb to all this world, calling people to bear the cross and follow him. This is the mission of the church. This is the mission that Mark leaves us with. May we respond like the women. Do you notice that women have names? What does that mean? I think it's a hint to me, very clear that they repented. Mary, Mary, son of mine, they all repented, like Alexander, Rufus, Simon, Nicodemus, Joseph. They have names, and their names are in God's book of life. May your name and my name be in God's book of life. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, our, our words are weak, and our thoughts are feeble. We couldn't capture the brilliance and the riches and the glory of the cross and the empty tomb. We thank you for Mark, that in his genius, he ended the gospel not with the typical Hollywood ending, but with a profound spiritual challenge for everyone who is reading his gospel. The question is, do we know Jesus? And if we don't know him, there's still hope, hope to turn to him, to the cross and the empty tomb, hope of the white robes. Grant us that white robes, grant us your righteousness, wash in the blood of the lamb. Grant us the white robe that will transform our life. Give us the weapons of your kingdom. Grant us lion hearts, Write us a piggy bank ready to be shattered and a blank sheet of paper. Make us yours and make us yours forever. Make our name, may our name be written in your book of life. Thank you so much for these women. Thank you for Joseph and Nicodemus. And thank you for the cross. Thank you for the empty tomb. May our life be living for your glory and your glory alone. We pray all that in the name of Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.